Today we're going to talk about art um, generally. It's going to be something of a whirlwind, but I'm going to try to kind of sculpt a way forward to see the arts and aesthetics, and we'll define that in a moment, and the role in taking care of people as they face the end of life, and ourselves in the doing. This is a Raphael painting that um, you see the lines. Vanishing point has a specific meaning in art history, in, in art making, where you draw intersecting lines that in three dimensions would be parallel. And this is a way to uh, create depth in two dimensions. Um, I also love the phrase just as something of, as, as an idea towards death. I th death is sometimes hard to define, when it's brain death or cardiovascular death or whatever it is. For me, death is the end of perception. And I kind of like that definition. It cuts across some lines that I find useful. OK, so I couldn't really decide uh, what to call. So I taught it three different things. So vanishing point, I've talked a little bit about that. Where do we, when do we vanish? Then this phrase, I could die today, I really, um, that was a, that's a catalyzing phrase for me when I find myself in very beautiful places, generally speaking. Yes, around friends and family too, but actually, I wonder if I want to die alone. I have my own thoughts about that. And when I feel like I could really die today, it's almost always in a sublime, natural setting, in the redwoods or at Yosemite, out here, um, or in a cathedral, or in a gallery space. So I've wondered what that, what is that effect? I'm trying to kind of figure out a way as a physician to capture that effect. What in the material world can prepare us to say goodbye to the material world? Then the last title is the most boring but most direct, the aesthetic domain and its place in contemplative care. So it's been said throughout this conference that contemplative care is a way of making space. And I guess I'm taking that a little bit li literally. I think we need to create space for us to do our work but spaces which inspire us, too. OK, aesthetic um, has a couple different definitions. As an adjective, we'll just kind of quickly run through. Pertaining to a sense of the beautiful or the science of aesthetics. Having a sense of the beautiful characterized by a love of beauty. Pertaining to, involving, or concerned with pure emotion and sensation as opposed to pure intellectuality. I kind of like the third definition for our purposes. Um, aesthetics is also a noun. It's a branch of philosophy. We'll talk a little bit about that as this part of the whirlwind trying to chip away at the subject. But it's not just pretty. It's not just beautiful. It's ugly, sublime, comic. Um, applicable to the fine arts with a view to establishing the meaning and validity of critical judgments concerning works of art and the principles of underlying or justifying such judgments. And we'll return to this concept of judgment and discernment which I think are really should be reserved for objects, not people. I mean, one of the things I think are very useful about artwork. The study of the mind and emotions in relation to the sense of beauty. Um, that's also a pretty good definition going forward. Another way of appro approaching this word is its antonym, anesthetic, which we all know what that means. I mean, you, that you're put to sleep. So maybe the opposite is true of the aesthetic that it is a way to wake you up. Immanuel Kant talked about it as a quickening, specifically music, as a quickening. Um, and I think that's a very useful concept. We want to do the opposite of anesthesia, in a way, here. Um, that, uh, it's a painting by Barnett Newman, one of the Stations of the Cross. And I'll just, with that in the backdrop, I'll just confess what's the impetus for me in this talk is my sense that Really, if I look around at the people I've helped take care of at the end of life, those who are really ready to go, and that seems to be a real goal, is to help people be ready to let go in a way. Many of those people, if I look at them sort of objectively, what's going on, they're ready to let go because one way or another life's become intolerable. That, that becomes a jumping off point. And that's useful in a way. It definitely prepares them to go, to let go. But I wonder if there's a more inspired way to do that. Do we have to stroke, do we have to choke, excuse me, do we have to choke the senses as a means to preparing someone to leave the planet? 
I, I really think we don't. And I would love to see palliative care and contemplative care lead the way in flipping that. Be so in love with the world, so overwhelmed by the beauty of it, that that's when we let go. That's when we give ourselves over to it. I may be asking a lot, and I don't want you to be Pollyannish. Death is hard. And I have to be very careful I do not impose that idea on others. But I sure would like to make a space for that. Okay, so a quick, so we'll kind of go through the arts in medicine uh, as they currently stand. And sort of the, some of the things, we'll go through some of the things I don't really want to talk too much about. Um, I would like to spend a moment on uselessness. I think there's a lot of power for, the, for us in this concept, and that comes right out of the philosophy of, of aesthetics. And then end with a sort of a challenge to the field. I already just laid one of them down. These are some images. There's a, there's a beautiful program at, at the Cancer Center where I work um, called Art for Recovery. And many cancer centers and hospitals have a similar program. Um, and a lot of beautiful things happen in that room. A lot of beautiful objects are made. And I don't mean beautiful as in pretty, but telling, deep, soulful work, expressive work. I like that one a lot. So this is a little bit of a review, sort of the state of things again, where, where things are now. So re art as reflection and expression, as a means to patients, perhaps, families, maybe even caregivers, expressing what they're going through. Because sometimes the written word doesn't cut it for many of us. Um, so that you'll see in programs like Art for Recovery. And it's a, a wonderful thing. Um, you also see it in Rachel Remen's work with Healer's Art and Rita Sharon's work in Narrative Medicine and others who are doing, Rita, uh, who are doing Narrative Medicine that's growing beautifully. And Harvey Chochinoff in Dignity Therapy. They all get at the similar thing. Art as in a means of expression. And if expressing what you're going through is therapeutic. Okay? That's not so much what I want to talk about, but it's useful and that's kind of where things are. I'm more interested in the second issue Ambiance, and I mean that in a fuller sense, not a trite sense, but where are we, where do we feel inspired? What spaces make us feel comfortable? So I'll show you some examples of this place called Maggie Center later on in the talk. But for reference, you might even just look around <clears throat> where we are. Wouldn't this conference be different if we were in a basement with, you know, acoustic tiles, um, you know, and stuff all over, beaten into the carpet, and no windows. Wouldn't this conference feel incredibly different? And that's just the setting. And I think that's something not to be ashamed of. That, I mean, sometimes I used to feel like maybe as a human being I should be more durable, less influenced by my surroundings. <laughs> totally the opposite for me now. This is a video we're not going to watch. <laughs> um, and then there's a little... I just mentioned this stuff, that art, um, especially the written word, can be used as a diagnostic capacity. For us clinicians in the room, it's important just to note this. And Rita Sharon and others make this point in, in, in narrative medicine. The Rorschach test is a good example of this. Uh, Gemma's perspectives on care at the close of life made this point, but always took you through a narrative laid down by the uh, patient and the physician. And that's how they bro broached subjects uh, in, in, in the writings. So there is a diagnostic purpose to arts, to the arts, perhaps. Again, not so much what I'm interested in today. But let's start getting at this idea of ambiance. And what, is, what, what can the arts set up in us? What can they facilitate in us? This is a list. Um, Marilyn Chandler uh, McIntyre, who is an English professor, wrote this and then bestowed it on Steve McPhee. And Steve McPhee is one of my mentors at work who gave it to me. So um, I think it's very, very useful. And Steve uses this in his <clears throat> Poetry at the Bedside talk, which is famous at UCSF. Steve's famous for weeping at the bedside, reading poetry with his patients. It's very tender and very therapeutic for both, both parties. OK, so we'll just run through this list of what perhaps poetry, at least, can do for us. So poetry stops us short. Okay, it, it calls us to contemplation. Again, a sort of a quickening. Poetry trains us in a metaphorical habit of mind. 
So they were not just looking at the world in sort of two dimensions, flat surface descriptors. Um, that's a big one. Poetry teaches us to dwell in paradox, another big one. We're, I was just talking yesterday with one of our participants here, Wendy. We had a beautiful conversation about the need to hold the classic line and pound of care of preparing for the worst, hoping for the best. Holding simultaneously opposing forces in tension. Poetry schools us in subtlety. And that gets at what I'd really hope for our field, is to be attuned to subtlety. Subtlety quickly goes out the window when you're in raging pain or emotional pain of any kind. Poetry disciplines us to see with precision. So again, wakes, wakes us up, quickens the senses, focuses our mind. Poetry calls us to play and to laughter. Don't need to state the importance of that stuff. Poetry reminds us of the hope of wholeness. Now there's a good one. That's <laughs> yeah, that's a good one, isn't it? Yeah. Um, poetry teaches us how to honor the complexity of things. Poetry, by asking us to widen our imaginations and suspend our judgments, trains us to compassion. You know, just open yourself to what is. And that's pretty powerful. That's a potent way in. And so, poetry calls us to attention. It's pretty mindful. There's Rothko. Okay. So... You know, I'm keen, for those of you who were at the existentialism conversation yesterday, I'm very keen to sort of look beyond the traditional medicine to see what else we can bring into the conversation to broaden our thinking about it. Philosophy, I think, is really underutilized. I really believe, for a lot of my work in clinic, a lot of the work I do is actually helping people conceptualize what they're going through. Is it, is it, are there philosophical questions that come up? I really, I, I, someday, maybe there'll be a clinical philosopher Maybe there'll be such a, a field as clinical philosophy. I won't hold my breath, but I hope so. Okay, so quick bullet points. So the a philosophy, a body of work, a philosophy, a collated body of work of aesthetics, around aesthetics, came into being with Immanuel Kant during the Enlightenment. <clears throat> Critique of judgment is the thing to read if you're interested to go more deeply. Um, so this line, purpose, purposiveness, I can't say that word because it's not really a word in English language. Purposiveness without purpose. That's, that's really, really powerful, really critical. Like we were saying earlier, as art for recovery and things and programs like that. Arts as a means to expressing or as a means to diagnosis. That's okay. Using it in that way is, is great. But I'm talking about art for art's sake in the same way of being for being's sake. And what could be more powerful at the end of life when someone has lost their sort of social utility, they're no longer in the workforce, you know, they're lying in the bed, taking up space by some metrics, they feel that, they're not contributing to the world in the ways that we acknowledge. And that is another way I see people get ready to die. They've lost a sense of utility and belonging that way. So, yeah, maybe looking for ways for them to contribute is one thing, and they do. And as clinicians, we can do that by making sure we receive things from them, that we learn things from our patients. That's certainly a beautiful utility. But there's also this other thing we can do, which is to establish a way of being or a way of thinking that, you don't, that utility doesn't really enter into it. So this is where art for art's sake can really teach us something. Okay, purposiveness without purpose. All right. And the power of disinterest in its, the, sort of the true sense of the word disinterest, not uninterest, but disinterest, that the object has its own, or the, the art, piece of art, or the little, the building that you create, the landscape, whatever it is, is its own universe. And you don't necessarily, there's no bias with it. It exists for and by itself. That's, that's disinterest. It's not concerned with the world around them. It's concerned with the world inside. Another a quote just to make the point from Oscar Wilde. This is from the uh, preface to the picture of Dorian Gray. We can forgive a man for making a useful thing as long as he does not admire it. 
The only excuse for making a useless thing is that one admires it intensely. <laughs> so, and art, all art is quite useless. You know, so um, I think that's a really fun way of putting it. Okay, Hegel, um, is the other person to know about in terms of just sort of the canon of philosophy of aesthetics. And if you want to go deeper with him, read lectures on aesthetics. He lectured wide, uh, widely. He didn't write a lot of books, per se. His students would transcribe his lectures, and after his death, published them. Um, OK, so for Hegel, art had, he was the one who put it into historical uh, uh, context. And that was a dynamic phenomenon, that art should be looked at through the eyes of the people who were around at the time. So that art may mean one thing to us now versus what it meant to the ancient Greeks. Um, so as a dynamic phenomenon, that was very important. Um, wow, the gods like Hegel. Um, um, art is the highest expression of Geist, the German word for, is it, for both spirit and mind, which is a nice conflation for our purposes, uh, or truth in sensuous form. Okay, so a very high idealized state. The art object had an idealized state in a human society for Hegel. Okay, the pinnacle was, the, was for him was the ancient Greeks, where the statues they made reflected and embodied their mythology system, their political system, their sense of beauty, Art would have been acknowledged from every strata of society. It was the most thorough penetration art had in any particular society, according to Hegel. And according to Hegel, art was in terminal decline since the Greeks. Um, so, but I think what for our purposes, the takeaway, like we had with Kant around purposelessness, um, the takeaway for Hegel is that art is part of a, compl a life completely and well lived for a human being. That to be the ability to see something not as a utilitarian object, but uh, a beauty for its own sake, that inspired you and made you wake up and realize you were alive and that that was a beautiful thing and that that wasn't going to last forever. Um, art can get you there for Hegel. This was sort of the human condition played out, manifest. Okay. And by creating art, you get to approximate God. And what a nice feeling. Hmm. So, can you imagine if you're the gods looking down on some, this is southern Utah. You know, you just, you look down on this beautiful thing you made. I mean, I don't pretend to be in the mind of God. But can you imagine creating a thing that had its own, you just set it into motion. And whatever came on it and with it and around it had its own life. You just, a genesis. And an artist does that in a microcosmic way. We can do that. And I don't mean artist as someone who's acknowledged by a magazine as an artist. We can do that. We can create our own little worlds, set them into motion. Okay. So, just want you guys to know about this group. They're in San Diego area. The Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture. So as we're seeing a lot around mindfulness, neuroscience is getting involved. And we're finding new ways to lend some sort of objective proof to what many people have known for a long, long time. But it's a very exciting period. And this will offer a way into softer subjects by lending hard science. And maybe some of those barriers and walls will be breaking down. I think they already are. But keep an eye on these guys. They're looking into exactly what is the effect of good architecture and design on the mind. What does it do to us? Okay, so it's sort of the underlying tone of our talk here, but these guys are lending some evidence based to it. I hope. They're a relatively nascent organization. Okay, these are just some examples. Uh, I referenced earlier around the idea of ambiance. Um, Maggie Centers. Has anyone here heard of Maggie Centers here? Some of you guys, okay. So, um, Maggie Jenks uh, and um, her husband, she died of breast cancer, I believe, in the 90s. And she and her husband were designers, wrote about architecture, um, and she set into motion this thing called the Maggie Center, which was to lend serious design, and specifically architecture, 
to the pursuit of managing and dealing with cancer. So there are now, I think, maybe half a dozen, I don't know for sure, and several more in the works being built now. Okay? So these are sort of good cases in point for our purposes. Um, this one is uh, by Frank Geary. He designed this one. And this is in uh, Dundee, Scotland. There it is again. I'm going to compare that to your local, you know, infusion center. You might feel differently about going to the infusion center. You know. the Rem Koolhaas is, we built one in Glasgow. This one is uh, concept phase, but to be built in Aberdeen, Scotland. Okay, how are we doing on time? Anyone got a clock? I need quarter to ten. How long do we have till? Ten. Okay. Okay. So ruminations, just some related thoughts, okay, that at least come up for me. And hopefully we'll have a little moment for some question and answering, okay. Um, meaning. Talked about this a little bit yesterday for those of you in the existential workshop. Meaning does not exist objectively, and it can't be conferred. It's a subjective pursuit. Again, it's something that we invest into an object, a place, a person, a thing. But so our task as caregivers is not to confer meaning, give meaning. I think our task is to make the conditions, set the conditions where meaning can be made. Okay? So one way we do that, and I think most people would agree on this first bullet point for palliative care as an end, you know, to support the act of making meaning. Another way of putting that is symptom management. You know, clear away all the distracting noise of pain, um, emotional drama, you know, breakdowns in family systems, all, you name it. All the things that make us suffer, our bodies suffer, our minds suffer. So to chip away at those things, not as an end of itself, but to make space, okay? There was a period in palliative care development where some people thought we were just going to be symptomatologists, that our purpose was to just treat pain. And that would be a great gift to the world, I think. But I hope we'll reach farther. We'll clear, we'll treat pain so that we can make space for that person to live a meaningful life in a way that they would dictate. Okay, and that's the second point. Providing raw material for meaning making, if we want people to pay attention, if that's a big goal, then maybe it's helpful, useful, instructive for us to give things that are worth paying attention to. You know, I think that's a big challenge in our time. You look around on television, billboards, and wherever else, most things that were trying to grab your attention, the harder you look at them, the more they fall apart, the less they hold up. That's a general rule I find these days. And I don't know how long that's been the case, but it's much of my life. It's pretty hard to find something that the closer, the harder you look at it, the more it gives you, the more it opens up, the more it unfurls. Okay? But that stuff exists, especially in the art world, especially in the design world. So maybe we can create spaces where there are be there's beauty, but there's just building blocks. There's stuff, stuff for the senses around. Okay, and we're, some of us were talking a little bit about this in re uh, regards to caring for people with advanced dementia. People who are not by choice, who are in the moment all the time. So can you imagine an environment where, yeah, there's some security uh, so that you might not wander off and hurt yourself, but it's not on a lockdown ward where you're stripped of all this sort of sensory uh, input. In fact, load them up with safe and beautiful sensory objects around them to make meaning to enjoy the moment. I think it would be, a very interesting scene. It'd be very interesting to see what happens. At Zen Hospice, we see this a lot. Just by virtue of being in a beautiful old Victorian in San Francisco, which is not a hospital, which is not a nursing home, just by virtue of being in that building, people really thrive. We have a problem that people live way too long <laughs> when they enter our house. I'm sure some of you guys have that issue as well. So. Okay. Death comes to the body. This is maybe, I don't see this as a belief. Um, I just want to find the sort of highest common denominator, no matter what our beliefs may be. I think death at least comes to the body. Okay. And I think of living as a sensory experience. 
So we are constantly engaged with the world through sensory input. That's how we move around the planet. And so for me, again, the death may be a better definition is the end of perception. I don't know how to put that in an advanced directive, but when I'm unable to take in anything from the world, to perceive anything, I think I'd be ready. I think that would be it for me. And I may not be in a position to do much with it. I may not, I may not be able to get out of bed. Um, but just the act of receiving the beauty of the world can be pretty potent. And again, you can do things with it in your mind. OK, so here's the tragic irony. Then that's it for me. Then maybe we'll open it up. Um, as the end of life approaches, just when life is most precious, in order to promote living, the healthcare system strips us of our senses, abuses our senses. Sterile environment, smelly environment, you know, bathing goes out the window for many people. I often think if you just put a bathing, a really well developed bathing center in a hospital, that alone could do magical things. So you, uh, you know, and as people are losing their senses, their sense of smell, their sense of touch, whatever it may be, there's always another sense around to work with. And, but we don't do any of that as a rule. Maybe on the side, you know, we have incense at the, at the guest house, at Zen Hospice, it's a beautiful thing, but so much more could be done. Okay, so my, my please um, is to restore sensuality as a prime, sort of indivisible, therapeutic mode, to see life and death through the senses at least. I think I have a pretty expansive idea of what constitute the senses. The mind is a sixth sense, perhaps. But restoring sensuality as a prime therapeutic, I think, would do wonders for our field. Uh, consider human development as a crescendo to death. That was my first point. Rather than just sort of this terminal decline and slipping away from life and out the door. Maybe we can crescendo. Maybe we can develop all the way to the end. And maybe that's the way to refashion for the baby boomers for, and for everyone to follow a new idea about what death could be. We're not going to take death away, but maybe we could expand into it. And then finally is to broaden the sense of an interdisciplinary team to include the humanities. Hospice and palliative medicine has done a beautiful thing by creating a team you know, an irreducible team, social worker, chaplain, nursing, physician. That's great. But I think there's so many other seats that could be at the table that could inform this process, like artists, designers. So that's it for me.